let's dig into something that's a little bit more complex now. So A9, improper assets management. So here's the scenario. Um, APIs tend to expose a lot of different endpoints, uh, more so than a traditional web application. If you think about traditional web applications, when I'm developing a page, if all of a sudden we don't use that page anymore, I just remove that page. Or if I'm thinking about something that we want to include in the future, but we're not using it yet today, um, you know, usually I don't write that page or expose it. Um, APIs are different. APIs, developers will expose details and pages and endpoints that basically might be used in the future. Or even harder, a lot of times through that API lifecycle management, you have to maintain older APIs and keep old APIs online for a really long period of time. Um, the general way that you can kind of think about working with and managing APIs through its life cycle is you can easily add to an API, but it's really hard to take away from an API. And the reason it's why it's really hard to take away from an API is because you have to maintain backwards compatibility or you have to go through this process of basically notifying your customers that, hey, we're removing this endpoint. It's really, it's, it's painful. Um, trust me, we just removed an API endpoint in our API. We got a lot of very angry phone calls from that. Uh, and we, we made lots of noise about it. We basically let everyone know for about three months that we were going to do it. We still got a lot of angry complaints. I apologize. We are very sorry for doing that. Uh, so something that uh, security teams also need to be aware of is a lot of times APIs will also expose um, hidden parameters or endpoints or status check or health check pages. Um, this is pretty common, especially if you're working in cloud services environments where you need to worry about like things like an elastic load balancer. You need to basically have pages for it to be able to hit and to check status and things like that. Um, and sometimes even APM tools will be a poll-based method. And so generally what this might look like is, well, even if I have something as simple as a hidden git slash server status, um, this might return a lot of extra data. And so, of course, this is exactly what I'm going to show you here. I'm going to just do a quick new share here and switch over to a Postman environment. Um, real fast, in terms of working with APIs, um, there's lots of different tools that are out there. Um, personally, I'm a really, really, really big fan of Postman. Um, it is hands down one of the best tools for working with REST-based APIs. It makes it really, really easy for you to be able to actually save your requests. Um, you can do lots of scripting it, with it as well. So where a lot of security practitioners are really comfortable working with tools like Burp Suite when they're working with applications, I actually just use Postman for most of my security testing capabilities. Um, the pre-request scripts and the tests and things that you can do, uh, you can actually weaponize Postman. It's really great. Uh, so now, ultimately, you can see here, this is my git slash server status request. Um, it's returning a ton of data. I mean, this is way more data than you should ever be returning through a server status page, but it gives you really a good point of exactly the type of stuff that some developers will do. Um, a lot of this may be benign. It's really about, hey, how's the server looking? What does it look like from a process perspective? But you know, I've got all sorts of juicy details in here like internal IP addresses. You know I'm running this on AWS network because it's ec 2internal internal. Um, you can see the different CPU types that I'm using and exposing. So you basically know, hey, if I need to DDoS this thing, well, this is actually a really tiny CPU in terms of how much I've actually provisioned to it. Of course, it's a test server. So this is the problem. Now, ultimately, one of the things that we do, and part of the reason why we strongly advocate, well, actually, let me, let me back up here first. Let me jump back into the web browser, and I'm gonna walk through what does the mitigation process actually look like for this. So there's a couple of different ways that we do this. First of all, if I have something like a server status page, I can mitigate this very quickly and easily by building a custom rule. Um, this can easily limit who's allowed to access it and still keep this page online. Um, this is a good option. This is something that I strongly advocate doing. I'm gonna walk through what that rule looks like in just a second. Now, alternatively, there's a better option. Um, and this is actually using that API security schema enforcement capability that I showed just a little bit ago. Um, this actually provides much more comprehensive protection. The reason why this provides much more comprehensive protection is because ultimately, if I did not define this in my Swagger specification file, and this is a hidden endpoint that basically we only wanna make available, API security is actually going to enforce that and say, we don't wanna allow any hidden endpoints to be exposed. This is really, really powerful because what this means is that even if you don't know that a developer has added a new endpoint and they didn't declare it in the Swagger specification, this means that they can't actually expose it until they officially declare it. 
this is what we mean by contract enforcement with that schema file. We're actually enforcing it down to the letter. And so if you don't declare it, I'm sorry, it's not allowed in. So let's walk through both scenarios here. So that first scenario, if I go into our rules here, you're gonna see, I'm gonna, I already created the rule just to save time, um, but this is a super, super simple rule. Uh, basically, if I go in here, all I have to do is say URL equals slash server status. I set my action to block, block request. Usually block request is fine. Um, one important thing, if you're working with APIs, never use require JavaScript support or require CAPTCHA support, or probably don't even require cookie support. Um, the API is probably, depending on the consumer of the API, it's probably not gonna be able to pass it. Uh, so we usually just rely on blocking request itself. Um, this rule is it, it's super simple, it's really easy. Um, this will shut down that access and at least we'll stop it. Um, the other thing that you can always do here too is I can always add additional predicates. Like let's say I want to actually allow this, but I only wanna allow this from certain IP addresses, like an internal IP where we go and query it, or let's say I'm using a poll-based method for an application performance monitoring solution and we're basically collecting data from an external service. I would probably go and add those to an allow list to effectively allow those connections in. So let's look at the other side though. As I go in and I look at the actual um, API security, I already uploaded the Swagger. I already basically had it set as uh, blocking mode before when I was running this yesterday. So I'm just gonna show you what this looks like from an alert perspective. Um, basically, when I mark that as blocking, and so I set the default action for blocking for whenever we don't see something, um, what ends up happening is we raise an API specification violation. So you can see right here. Um, now, interestingly, one thing we're always asked about is in terms of, you know, how do rules execute and how do they work? Um, you'll also see here that in-cap rules were raised. So my A9 demo improper assets management rule was also raised when I, pers when I had it previously set to block. So we actually triggered on three different violations on one individual API request. Um, the reason is because all of the policies actually technically run on every request. Um, and we just take the highest enforcing action. So you can see here, I had a request blocked and alert raised, and then ultimately this was blocked. Um, but you can see that ultimately, this is where we had a violation type of invalid URL. Invalid URL on an API specification violation means that this URL was not defined as part of that Swagger specification. So this is how we look at basically being able to mitigate this capability. Now, switch back over to Postman here. I'm gonna walk you through a caveat. When I go and I block that on the very first time, this is the response that I'm gonna get. Now, there's a problem here if anyone sees it. Um, I, it's an API and I responded back in HTML. Um, no APIs are going to be able to speak HTML. They don't expect this type of data coming back. Um, this is the default behavior. So you need to be sure that you're uh, very cautious of this. Now, what ends up happening is we need this API to respond back in JSON format because that's the way that it's really designed. So to do this, what we're gonna do is we're gonna switch back over here and there's a setting and there's actually a couple settings and I'll walk through both of them. Under settings for the site, we go into general and we scroll all the way at the bottom here. There's API security settings where we basically have abilities to modify some of the default behaviors here. And then there's this poorly, poorly named miscellaneous flag here. And I've already told our UX designers and they're gonna fix this. Uh, but we have something in here called enable content-based error messages or error responses. Uh, this, there's very little documentation around this, but this is really, really important. When you check this box, what this means is if I go back over into Postman and I go back over to my server status page now, uh, where I basically have any saved example, if my header comes across and I basically specify my content type and my accept, and the key thing that we're keying off of here is the accept header. Um, the accept header is basically what the client is indicating to the server. This is what I expect to get back in terms of response. If I set this to application JSON and I have that header set or that flag set in the settings, this is the error message that I'll get back. So instead of getting back HTML, now I'm actually going to get back JSON. This is great. This is exactly what we need in terms of the API. There's just one problem. If we go in and we look at the error response that's defined in the Swagger specification, we look at how the API is designed, 
it unfortunately doesn't match what we're expecting. The error code comes back. You can see here that this is a 403 bad request, but ultimately when an, a, an unsuccessful request to this API comes back, this API actually is generally expected to return a status object, which contains success false, a code that's actually pasted back in the body that matches 401 unauthorized here, um, and a message. Uh, especially for a lot of your applications, they're going to be coded to expect this type of response. So while it's great that we were able to go and actually return JSON back, it has no idea what to do with this because it doesn't look like the JSON that's actually defined. So luckily, we've got a fix for this. So I'm gonna go back over here real fast. And if we go back into our rules, this is another new feature, we released it. I actually didn't even know about this until one of my colleagues let me know about it. So that's how stealthy we are about releasing some of these features. And ultimately, we have this rewrite response category. Uh, I'm gonna dig into this in just a second a little bit further. But you can see here we've got our, uh, whoops, wrong one. You can create custom error responses for APIs in here. And so it's pretty simple to set up. Don't define any predicates to match unless you wanna make a uh, specific match criteria based on whether this is XML or JSON. So we basically can support both. And then ultimately what we wanna do is we wanna set the rule action to rewrite response error. We can set the error type, so basically the HTTP response code. So in this case, I'm gonna basically just say um, access, to, or sorry, this is going to be based on any type of access denied issue, uh, but we have lots of other different error types that come up. So basically um, any of these you can set. Um, basically if there's backend server errors or things like that, I can modify that. And then the response status code, in this case, I'm gonna go ahead and I'm gonna say, this was a bad request. And now in the response body, I can actually go in and I can define what the actual structure looks like. So here's my status object here. And then I'm gonna go ahead and I'm gonna create a new details object. And I'm gonna put all of the various details that we can in the placeholders that we have to ensure that we get the correct messaging and everything across. So now if I go back over to Postman and I show you what this looks like, I basically have, and let me switch to what a good error response looks like. Yep best error response looks like, here we go. So I have all that same information, but now it's actually following in, structure, in the same structure as what the API is expecting. And I'm returning a 400 bad request. This is awesome. So this is something that I really, really strongly recommend as you're starting to onboard your APIs, take the time to make sure that the actual responses and error pages that we're returning actually follow and match what the API specification and schema looks like. And there we go. So just a quick recap on improper assets management. So number one, custom rules, they work in a pinch. They're a good way to be able to get you started. And if you need to shut down a vulnerability really, really quickly, uh, more often than not, we see this as a result of a pen test. Um, good way to do it. Um, but schema enforcement is ultimately a better way and a better solution to be able to do this because it's more comprehensive. You don't have to play whack-a-mole. You can basically enforce that contract. And of course, last but not least, don't forget to set your error responses. 